gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Offsides, uh, kicking off our NFL talk here for today. Uh, it is Super Bowl week. Pro Bowl is uh, now in the past. The focus is on the Super Bowl, Bengals, Rams. Uh, kind of a key factor for this game, at least one that I'll be definitely paying attention to, is the performance of each receiving core. Uh, dissecting both of these teams, which team are you giving the edge to in this position for this game? That's a good question because I see both of these receiving cores almost identical. Um, Stafford Burrow average. Stafford averages 28.7 yards per game. Burrow's 28.8 or 288 and Matthew Stafford's 287.4. So they're close right there. Um, as far as team stats, yards per game, Rams are just a little bit better with 372 to 361. Um, that 20 or 10 yard differential is in the passing game for the Rams. So I think the, the I think the receiving lead goes to the Rams, but also with the vulnerability of throwing it that much, you have way more turnovers. Um, that is going to be the factor, I believe, in this game. If if Matthew Stafford doesn't have any turnovers, I think the Rams go sailing and and win this one in a close game. If they do have a turnover, I see Cincinnati winning this one in a close game. Either way, I see it being really close. Um, but yeah, receiving core, I'm gonna give the, I'm gonna give a little bit of an edge to the Rams. Sounds good. I guess kind of a follow or like a, a follow up question to that. If you're, you know, we've talked about the kind of this like money is no object. You're starting your own NFL team next five years, which receiving core would you build around? If you get to keep them exactly as is right now at the performance that they're playing at. And then would you also be getting Van Jefferson back for the Rams then as well in that core? Yeah. Like, like, or excuse me, Robert Woods, when he gets back from healthy, like came in there as well. Yeah. I'd say the Rams. Don't get me wrong, Jamar Chase is an unbelievable talent. Um, that team is is really good, but where that team really wins its game is how much it moves on the ground and its defense is where it really relies on to win because they know that their offense can score points. Same with the Rams. like They know that they can score points on offense is why they throw it so much. If you get stopped, can you run? will your run game and your defense bail you out? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely with you on that as well. I mean, a lot of times it's the, oh, the youth, they're already playing so well. But at the same time, um, I mean, there's, there's been the comparison all year of, oh, Joey Burrow isn't going to, like, falter at all going to Kansas City. He's played in louder stadiums in the SEC. Like, the, the, like the, the bright lights haven't been too much for him. But at the same time, this is like as bright as the lights get and the noise and the like pressure that they're, these guys might or may not have on them. I mean, some guys like don't have pressure at all because they, they're confident in what, what they're able to do. Some, sometimes when you get to a big game like this, you see guys who have been a key factor for their whole career, this whole season that they – take a dive because they let the nerves get to them or the, the stage is a little too big. Um, which I mean, for all these guys, or a lot, I shouldn't say all, a lot of these guys, um, this is their first Super Bowl. Um, on the Rams side, they have more guys cause they just had been there four or five years ago, but, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see the youth and, uh, this is the first time being there what guys are leaned upon have been leaned upon all season that meet the expectation and the ones that kind of come up short with either miscues, turnovers, whatever it might be. Um, 
and obviously the Bengals side has more, again, more of that. None of these guys have ever ever been in the Super Bowl. Um, Quick turnaround. Like they haven't built up a couple of years to where it's like, oh, they made the playoffs. Oh, they lost. Oh, they got a little farther in the playoffs. Oh, they lost. Where they're building that experience. Okay, we know what it takes to get back here. It's kind of a Cinderella story for them where if it ends with them holding the Lombardi trophy, awesome. If it doesn't, it's going to be, Interesting because again, with the offseason coming up, a lot of these guys are young, proved themselves this year, end of the contracts, they want more money. Um, who knows if they go elsewhere? But the pressure wise, I feel like Cincinnati, I feel like, has no pressure in this situation. Rams are staying at home, sleeping in their own beds, playing in their own stadium that they play in. They have a lot of vets on their team, they brought in a whole bunch of guys. Like, they locked and loaded to go win. Cincinnati, like you said, Cinderella story, they've had zero expectations from the start of the year. Zero. Like, there was no – I don't think anybody was like, Cincinnati Bengals are going to win the – win get to the Super Bowl, like, confidently um, before the season started just because there was no what to expect here with the pieces that they have. Joe Burrow with the full season, if he stays healthy, he has. I feel like all the pressure is on L.A. in this situation, and Cincinnati can go out there and just play without half, without having to put that extra pressure on them because, like you said, how young that team is. They've already gone into the number one seeds house, on the road, one. Kansas City Chiefs, a lot of stadium in the NFL, on the road, one. After being down in a huge hole. Like, I feel like they have no fear. That's the word. That's the word I'm going to use. They have no fear of whatever they see. They know that the, how they can play, they can overcome anything that's in front of them. And, like, as far as pressure, I feel the most pressure on a person in this entire game is Matt Stafford. Does he finally get his trophy? You know, like Mm -hmm. everybody knows he's deserving of one, but he still hasn't won one. Um, If he doesn't get it this year, does he have another chance to get, you know, like it almost seems like the Rams team was perfectly built to get to this point as well. This is going to be a great, a great game. I feel like this is going to be one of the best Super Bowls we've seen in a while. Yeah. It's definitely an odd one. Again, Bengals Rams, uh, like, what 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 were the odds on that preseason of that being a Super Bowl matchup? Like far down the list compared to other matchups. Um, Bucks but, Pats was the top one. Yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, I like you said, both like both teams deserve to be here. I agree that I like if there's one way that it's like okay, the pressure is one way or the other. I mean, lot like look at last year though too, Bucks. Played on the road all postseason, and then they secure a home playoff or a home Super Bowl for the first time ever. Even though they were in a away team, and now the Rams, because this will be the last Super Bowl record that'll be set as far as teams playing in it, unless they're like getting there for the first time. Because mm-hmm. the Bucks last year, like you said, hosted the Super Bowl, but they were the away team. This year, Rams are hosting, and they're the home team. So that is the other record that falls here. So it is a little bit different as far as that even added pressure because they did play the champion, NFC Championship game in L.A. That wasn't an easy one. Um, they struggled. They could have blown out San Francisco if they would have not turned the ball over. And I think that's what it's going to come down to is like is Matthew Stafford, the one guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know what you're going to get out of the rest of the team. You know what you're going to get out of the Bengals. They've been pretty steady the last, the whole playoffs and really the last couple of weeks going into the playoffs. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, that's going to come down to Stafford and if he can avoid turn. I mean, even in that game against San Francisco, he had only one pick. And that was what we talked about going into that game as well. If he has a pick, so long as it's not detrimental, it's not when they're backed up to where it's going to immediately turn into six or a field goal. It didn't. They threw a field goal or he threw an interception. Defense got a stop, got them the ball back. 
So I think that that play that's that's going to be the exact same thing in this one. If the Bengals can directly turn a Matthew Stafford interception into points, then yeah, I could see like the Bengals edging out a, a close one. But yeah, if Stafford either has no turnovers or like against San Francisco, it doesn't turn into points on the other side. I mean, top to bottom, I would say the Rams are the better team. I mean, defensively as well. I know my question was about the receiving core, but just defense top to bottom too. They have better talent as far as experience, uh, long time pro bowlers, like proven that like there's a lot, there's don't get me wrong. There's guys on that Bengal team that have had great for like first season, first couple seasons here coming in, but to have the longevity of Von Miller, Aaron Donald, Jalen Ramsey, some of these guys that have been able to do what they do year after year after year, it's hard not to give them the edge on that side of the ball. Yeah, Trey Hendrickson should be able to make it back. I know he's been out uh, for the Bengals all postseason. He should be back for their D-line for the Super Bowl. So that's a huge boost, as well as C.J. Uzama their tight end that also was injured against the Titans. He also is, looks like he's slated to play. So those are two huge impact guys that are also coming back for the Bengals that I feel like, I don't know. That's the thing about the Bengals. It's like on film, they use everybody. The Rams, they kind of Cooper cup kind of target OBJ a little bit in certain situations. Cincinnati, I feel like Joe is just whoever's open is open. I don't care. There's not one specific guy that I'm looking for in any situation. You're open, you're getting the ball. Yeah. And it seems like Stafford, like even watching him postseason ending of the year, when the pressure was dialed up, it's like he was always looking for Cooper Cup. Mm-hmm. So well, that'll be thing. another thing to watch as well. Yeah, well, same thing for the Bengals, though, in that AFC Championship game. I remember when the Bengals were on the goal line, Burrow went to to chase, like, three times in a row, and then they got a touchdown. So it's like – in well, situation one one, you take the chance. Yeah. The top guy, no matter what. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's going to be a great game. I mean, it's Tuesday. It was still, like, basically five days out yet, but – as we get closer and closer, kind of the, the media days here, the hype continues to build. We'll, we'll keep touching on it this week. Yeah, sounds good. And then um, I over to my question here for you. The Saints now hired Dennis Allen, their longtime defensive coordinator, who's done a tremendous job for the organization. That was my thought of who they were going to sign right away for their pick. I'm glad that I ended up being right and as well for the organization. I feel like he is the perfect fit to replace Sean Payton after working in lockstep with him basically for a long period of time. Um, With him now taking the reins as head coach, what do you see them doing with their quarterback situation? And how do you see them, I guess, major people that they let go sign or have to re re, um, sign redo their contracts to get underneath their 71 million currently over the cap. Yeah. The quarterback situation is definitely interesting because Jameis Winston, again, towards ACL mid season um, on a perfect pace, he's not going to be able to get back until that, I think week five, week six, Mark, whatever that was when he tore, when he tore it. Um, So you're going to need somebody to get the ball rolling to start the year, whether that's Taysom Hill, Trevor Simeon, um, they go after a guy, maybe. And I know it was your last week or maybe off, off camera. We talked about this a couple of times. I think that Taysom, like they, they restructured Taysom Hill's deal. I mean, it, like, as cool as it is that they've been keeping him and kind of using him as, like, a Swiss Army knife kind of role, I think it's time to move on from him and go for a true quarterback. Um, I mean, anytime you have kind of that hybrid guy, it, it hasn't worked out for teams a whole lot. I mean, for instance, look at the Baltimore Ravens, Lamar Jackson, kind of that running back, quarterback hybrid 
as far as how much he runs the ball. Yes, he has success, but when it comes to being a true passer of the football, it's not quite there. Interceptions, bad decision making, can't take a game over when he needs to, and like in short, short time situation, move the ball downfield through the air and get it done. Um, I mean, Kyler Murray, another guy, like the, 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 there's guys Patrick that Mahomes, Josh Allen, that get well. Those guys have shown success of like getting either to the Super Bowl or an AFC Championship. As far as like, uh, uh, the Ravens, like they've never they never got to an AFC Championship with with uh, Jackson. The Saints have never like we're unable to turn the season around and make it to the playoffs with Taysom Hill. Um, in some cases, like, like you said, like Mahomes, Allen, guys who kind of lean on the run a little bit more than other quarterbacks do. There's some success with it again, with the right personnel, with the right coaching. I don't think that the Ravens, and then in this case, the saints are a team that are able to do that, especially now that you have a defensive head coach taking the reins um Sean Payton's gone arguably one of the best offensive minds to ever coach the game you take him out of the equation what happens to that offense now um unless unless he he plans on turning Hill into a true quarterback like let less designed runs more like pocket passing and try to develop him that way um but otherwise, I think it'd be smart for them to move on from him, honestly. Even though they restructured his deal, see, it's more of like a it, – at first it was voidable to where basically, like, they could get rid of him and they wouldn't owe him any money. But if he stays, he earns more as time goes on. That's kind of how his contract is now. It's kind of a hybrid based on X amount of snaps he plays in certain positions. He makes more or less money kind of thing. Um but yeah, I don't see it working out for them keeping Taysom Hill. And I don't think Trevor Simeon either. His time in Denver, he didn't really do a whole lot. He comes to the Saints. He tries to he keeps them somewhat afloat, but it doesn't have that it factor to again get them get them to the postseason. So what do they do with James Winston? I mean, I think he I take him over the other two, but again, his eligibility is going to be a huge question mark well obviously we'll know more when we get closer to the season if some if he has some crazy recovery and he's good to go week one or if it's going to be closer to that midway point of the season before he gets back um like i'd say built like uh, i don't know i guess try to try to he's currently not under contract with them anymore Oh, they only brought him in for this past year. Yeah, oh, that was the end he, of his year. I should it say. was the end of his. It was the end of his other deal that he had. But it's a, it's technically an option. So if the Saints are outbid, there he he walks. Yeah, but who's gonna go get a guy that has a torn ACL? But a guy who did he, he was at fourteen touchdowns, three interceptions before he was horse collar tackled. That did it. Yeah. The Saints were a winning football team before that happened. Like he's a proven quarterback. He know he can throw touchdowns. Yeah, but what team? Like that's a thing. You bring you go out and Giants, get, you, like Carolina, like there's teams that I feel like are gonna. So that Cam Newton, Daniel Jones starts the season. They're zero and four, zero and five, one and five. All I right. feel like even a shorter Winston's lease healthy. than that. I feel like a shorter, like, especially for James's situation, too. Well, that's what I'm saying. As far as James coming back, he's not going to be able to come back till week five, six on a perfect schedule as far as a full calendar year to where you, you tell him, all right, we picked up James Winston. He's, el- he's going to be eligible week six. If we have a losing record at that point, he's stepping in, you're out kind of thing. Or he goes to a team where there's a young guy in there and he – Type of mentor type role. Yeah. Like Houston. Miami. Yeah. I don't know. I just think that he's a good quarterback. And if the Saints don't pay good money to keep him, I feel like we're going to see him on another team. Denver. Like, 
I feel like we're going to see him on a different team playing quarterback this next year as a QB one. Yeah. Yeah. And then as far as like the cap is like, I mean, to some of the notable people here, just Traquan Smith, wide receiver, Quan Alexander, linebacker. They have Ty Montgomery, Jeff Heath, their safety, Jalen Holmes, defensive tackle, Dwayne Washington, running back. Then they also have Juwan Johnson, wide receiver, Ethan Greenridge, tackle, Jalen Dalton, defensive end, Deontay Hardy, another wide receiver, Carl Granderson, defensive end. These are all people who are set to make a good penny next year that all aren't going to be able to. I mean, there's only really three or four names on that list. The first three or four you mentioned. Um, Callaway, Alexander. They're all going to be free agents. Yeah, I think those are guys you keep. After that, I mean, again, none of those none of those other guys have seemed like like they they don't stick out to me as oh that they got to keep that guy. He's phenomenal to where they let them go, free up some cap, or um. They keep them for cheap deals to say, all right, we'll keep you, but you got to prove yourself kind of thing. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it seems like every, like as much, as much as like on paper cap is an issue, it seems like every off season, all oh, this team's fucked. They're this much over the cap. And then they come into the, the next season completely fine. So it's, it seems like less of a worry because they have these guys that know how to, Figure it out, push it into the future, get rid yeah, of it. Yeah, but seventy-one million is so much to push on. I don't like Tampa. The is that the most? Is that the most? Are they, yeah, the that's most? the most ever in the history of over the cap at this point. Tampa, when they redid their salary cap gymnastics and kept everybody, they were only like eighteen million over. So this is like six times that amount. Yeah. <laughs> Because they, because they do have to resign Marcus Williams or safety, arguably one of their best defensive players. They need to resign him. They're not going to let him walk. And Teron Armstead, who's their offensive tackle, who's been there, fucking the Drew Brees protector. Like he's been there since thirteen. Um, yeah, like that's another guy who's going to take a good chunk of money to keep. And PJ Williams, also their top corner. Another guy that they should probably keep. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they're this is, whole situation is going to be very interesting to see what they do because if they can somehow make this work, like you said, seventy-one million, then there should be no worry ever in the history of salary yeah. cap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you find a way to hide, to cover up seventy one million dollars and keeping a lot of your guys, that's ins- that guy should do everybody's taxes or yeah. everybody's whatever. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, yeah, like you like those those free agents you mentioned. There's only a couple that are seem worth keeping. Obviously, I'm not a Saints like a huge Saints fan. I don't watch every single game, so I mean. People are watching this might be like, oh, but this guy's good. This guy's good. What are you talking about? I mean, there might be a couple of guys that are like worth keeping as well. But as far as household names that I've seen on the highlight reels make a difference in the games I have watched, um, yeah, there's only a couple on that list that stick out to me. But yeah, one thing we forgot to even mention, Alvin Kamara's issue with the battery thing. Does, oh, he, get yeah. a suspe- does he get a suspension from the NFL and have to miss games? Michael Thomas, does he come back? Does he play? Yeah. Or, like, even – I mean, obviously, like, you don't want to release the guy because he's one of the best running backs, but there's so many times where, like, a player has, like, a DUI, assault charge, battery, whatever it might be, and the team releases them, then like, shortly after. So it, it's like, does he fall yeah. into that bucket of they don't want to deal with – they don't want to deal with the, the legal issues of keeping him – and him not being eligible for however long to start the season that they let him walk. And then he's arguably the, the, aside from like Rogers and Russell Wilson, the next most valuable guy in free agency this year. Yeah. I don't see that they let him go. I feel like this is, 
obviously this isn't the same situation as like the Ray Rice thing because that was like caught on video and all that stuff. But like how good he was to the team at the time, they didn't want to get rid of him. They didn't want to cut him right away. They made they waited the last second till the NFL came in and said, "Okay, dude, like you're not going to be able to." I feel like this is going to be the same type of situation here in New Orleans. Unless the NFL comes out and gives a suspension, a fine, or whatever, nothing's going to happen because he is the focal point of that team. Mm -hmm. And if he got into a fight with in a bar with some drunk asshole, props to him. Mm -hmm. At least somebody hit somebody all fucking Pro Bowl weekend. Yeah, no kidding. I feel like it helps him too because it is now the off season to where the NFL might be like, all right, you have to go to a couple classes on a couple Saturdays to kind of. Well, I think that's the least of the NFL's worries at this point with all the heat that they're facing as far as owners paying for losses, yeah. fucking teams cheating, fucking. Yeah, the whole floor is still going on. Yeah. There's a lot the NFL has to deal with right now. Yeah. Yeah. I did see a meme though. Um, the Raiders could have almost their, a full seven-on-seven seven NFL squad from the players that are currently there or got arrested in Vegas during the year this year. <laughs> There's five. That's hilarious. It's, it was like the Las Vegas – or it was like uh, Vegas's correctional football team. <laughs> uh Debbie Arnett, R- Ruggs, Camara. Camara, and I forgot the two other people on there. They're either – I think they're still in, in like, jail there from previous years or whatever. They weren't people that just like this last year. Oh. At least that we know about. Yeah, they call it Sin City for a reason. <laughs> Moving over to the ice, uh, my first kind of take question for you here, looking at the goaltending of the St. Louis Blues, uh, Billy Huso now leads uh, the league in goals allowed per game at 1.90 and has the best save percentage at uh, 94.1. Uh, currently sitting at fourth in the central, do you think that his tending so long as he keeps this up is enough to get them back into that top three uh, in the central, because in that, in that conference as a whole, it's going to be tight for those wildcard spots. So you don't want to be stuck in that, in that pool of, of wondering how that your season's going to finish. Do you think that they, that their tending is enough to get them back in that top three? I mean, if we could see some sort of performance that we saw to Jordan Bennington when the St. Louis Blues went on to win the Stanley Cup, being almost dead last place come January, and to go on the run, switch your goalie, and your goalie catches fire, and literally you ride him all the way to the Stanley. If he could pull something like that, sure, I could see them getting back into the top three. But I don't – just because of the sample size that um, Saros has played – um, or excuse me, Huso, he's only played 14 games this year, which is not a whole bunch. Granted, he is nine, three and two. So 66% win percentage. That's pretty good. Um, but 66% of the games, if you win that the rest of the way out, you ain't getting into the top three. Um, I feel like where this blues team is going to come down to, is their goal scoring as they've been lacking as of late, as far as being able to put the puck in the net. Um, Yeah. I mean, earlier this year we were seeing five, six, seven goals a game. And now, I mean, they did have five the other day, but their goal scoring as late has been, I guess it's only been really that good if they've had to play in shootout, like shootout style games, like six, five against the Maple Leafs, um, five, three, they did beat the crack at five, zero, um, a while ago, but then they get pounded by the flames, seven, one. Then the next night they come back and beat the flames five to one. Like they're too streaky. I feel like they're too 
inconsistent of a team, but a goaltender's job is to bring that consistency to the lineup so that the boys can, I guess you play, depending who's in the net, you play a certain style of game. You know, you just know the guy back there can stop those pucks. You know where these, you just kind of know how the game's going to go with who's in net. And yeah, I mean, all things are possible. It would be pretty cool if they did go on another tremendous run um, and get back in there, but I don't see them cracking that top four spot as. Well, they're in the, uh, Aval- in the fourth Aval- spot right now. I'm saying I'm, I meant the three. Yeah, I meant the three. Avalanche, Nashville, and the Wild are just too good right now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as good as as good as their tending has been, I mean, second least amount of goals allowed in the Central, um, which is one of the top. I mean, aside from the. Atlantic is one of the top scoring uh, divisions, or I think the second best scoring division in hockey, um, just overall, as far as top, top to bottom, how many goals are getting scored. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess I could see St. Louis going like maybe sneaking as a wild card, but again, how the cards fall when it comes to that, uh, you're, dancing with a bunch of teams when it comes, when it comes that close at the end. Uh, but I mean, right now in the, in the, in the West, they would have a wild card spot locked up as uh, looking at the Pacific Calgary's at 52 points. Uh, so they have a five point lead. Calgary does have two games to make up. So even with those two games made up, they still would have the lead over Calgary. But again, we're still still basically half half the season to go here for a lot of these teams as far as games played. Um, like you said, it'd be cool to see them pull it off. But yeah, I, I agree with you. It's going to be hard to get past Minnesota, Nashville, Colorado with how well they've all been playing. Yeah, agreed. And then uh, on to my question for, for you here. Do you – so Toronto, for, for everyone, just a quick recap. Toronto ended up beating Calgary last night in overtime. Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> Who did I say? Calgary. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I saw the logo. Um, yeah, Carolina ended up beating Toronto last night in a shootout. Um, Toronto beat Carolina. <laughs> I got you. I got you. <laughs> Toronto beat Carolina in an <laughs> overtime yesterday um, to get two huge points as Carolina has kind of been that team who's been dominating the East almost at this point with games in hand. They're the big, bad team. Um, Toronto proving that they can win. Matthews injured early in the game. They found a way to win. Do you think this is the year? that Toronto seems like they're poised enough to make it past the first round in the playoffs if they do get there. I mean, early season, like, the, I mean, even, even till this point, just the success they've had this year kind of sticking in the top of uh, the Atlantic, still making some noise despite being in the, the shadow of Florida and Tampa. Yeah, with games in hand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I kind of look at this situation, I mean, a lot like our Packers, as far as not being able to get over that hump of the NFC championship of they have what it takes to get there, but do they have enough to get past that point? The more I like every see every the last couple of seasons, as far as just that curse of can't get past the first round, can't get past the first round. They don't make a lot of huge changes, really. I mean, they still got the same. They still got Campbell. They still got Matthews. They still got a lot of these same core guys that they're like, we got to keep these guys like, and like a couple pieces move here and there in the off season. I mean, do they have the talent to get past? Of course they do. They have the talent to win a Stanley Cup, but I think that there's a strong possibility they come up short again, and we might see some new faces. Uh, in Toronto next year if they don't make it because 
how long do you keep these kind of guys and, and not be able to get over that hump? You know what I mean? Like Matthews, like Campbell, as tough, as tough as it would be to get rid of those guys, like look at the Packers. How like how tough is it to get Aaron get rid of Aaron Rodgers? It's hard. But if you can't get past that hump, you can only you can only come up short for so long before you got to make a big change. Um, so yeah, I mean, kind of looking at it both ways. Yes, they have the talent. Yes, they have the the coaching, the everything they need to get past that first round and make it to a cup. But if they come up short again. I think it's time that we see some changes in Toronto. What changes would you make? I mean, they kind of like they kind of lean heavily on 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 math. I mean, look, kind of like uh, Edmonton leans heavily on Drysital McDavid to get it done every night. Matthews is kind of that. I mean, they have other goal scorers, but he's kind of that standout guy where if he has an off night, Toronto loses. If he if he's skating like crazy, he they get the win. So where you bring in a guy, kind of like a, an Edmonton situation where it's not all on his shoulders to where you have somebody else who can get it done alongside with him um, and get rid of some of your uh, younger guys that you, you might be trying to build around to take that chance as kind of a – we're going all in for one or two years to try to go make a run for a cup. Um, I mean, Campbell's been like very consistent. Yes. There's times where it's like, okay, yeah, he gives up a lot of goals on like a couple nights here and there or whatever. Um, But overall he's been one of the most consistent goaltenders the last two or three seasons here. Um, I don't know. I mean, getting rid of him would be you, – you'd, you'd have to bring in somebody who's obviously, a, like, better than Campbell. And there's only – you can only count in – my, in my opinion, you can only count on one hand maybe guys who are better than Jack Campbell right now in the net. And you ain't taking him from their team. No. So, and again, unless you can get a lot of value back uh, from Austin Matthews to where you get rid of him and get two, three guys who are good enough goal scorers to equal slash do better than what he's able to bring to the table. I mean, like I said, those are two guys that you want to keep, but at the same time, how long do you keep them and keep coming up short? Well, this team was originally built from five years ago when they drafted Matthews and Mitch Marner both. Those were the two young guys who were supposed to come in and change this franchise. They did, don't get me wrong. They've gotten to the postseason. They still got to that same point. They've added John Tavares from the Islanders, a huge pickup years ago. They've added all of the vets that you need to, Wayne Simmons from the Flyers, Jason Spezza, Jake Muzzin from the Kings, who's won a couple cups. Like They, they have the... They have the perfect – on paper, they have the perfect team to be able to go there. But like you said, if, if they play a physical opponent and not more of a skill-based, which is the division that they play in, that Florida, Tampa, that Atlantic is more skillful than physical, if they get matched up against a Metro team – that is physical, like the Hurricanes, the Rangers, the Capitals. They could be going home round one. Um, mm-hmm. If they do get a luck of the draw and don't, this could be their year that they could go to the dance. Um, as they are, them in the wild are the hottest hottest teams in the league right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean – yeah, this as you mentioned, like some of the moves they make, it's like if it pays out in the end, they're great moves. If it doesn't, like every like every off season, that's all they've built is just, that's all they've done every off season is add one guy, one guy, one guy, two guys, one guy, all different sorts of. I feel like they've tried everything and they yeah. haven't fucking still got past. Yeah. Them. Which again circles back to that point I started with Matthews and Campbell. As hard as it would be to get rid of one of those, if not both, at what point do you move on? 
It would be Mitch Marner would be the guy that they'd get rid of. He gets paid a lot of money, and in the playoffs, he doesn't perform like he does during the regular season. Let's just say that. As far as get, like being effective and getting those points. Like there's some players who do average during the regular season or below like below average to what they normally get. And then the postseason, they're unbelievable point point per game players. And then you have guys who put up 150 points during the regular season and put up three in the playoffs. Like that is if Marner can kind of get out, out of his playoff shadow, whatever has put that upon him, whether that's the pressure of playing in Toronto um. Yeah, I feel like he has been the reason. Matthews has done it all. He's done everything that he can. Um, like you said, they need that secondary, secondary scoring, and Marner is a huge piece. Of the, I really do see that they can move on from him if he has another shitty postseason. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's somewhere to start without kind of cleaning house. Because it is also one of your young guys that who still has a, a ton of upside, mm-hmm. it's worth a lot of money, and you could get a good return. Yeah. And you're not blowing up your team by getting rid of Matthews. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. Well, thanks, everyone, for tuning in to today's episode. Make sure you come back on Hump Day for our next episode.